So welcome to the afternoon panel. This is Panel C, Goddess Studies, Theology, and Egalitarian Matriarchal Studies. Our panel members are Joan Marler, Inhi Lee, Nene Jordan, and Lisa Christie. So our first panelist, our first speaker is Joan Marler. And the title of Joan's presentation is Honoring Carol P. Christ and acknowledging and her acknowledgement of Marija Gambutas. So Joan Marler is the executive director of the Institute of Arche Archaeomythology. She's the author with Harold Harmon of Introducing the Mytho Mythological Crescent from 2008. And she's the editor of The Civilization of the Goddess by Marija Gambutas, 1991 from the Realm of the Ancestors, an anthology in honor of Major Gambutas, 1997, the Journal of Archaeomythology, Mythology, 2005 to the present, is also the author of the Danube Script, 2008, and other publications. Joan lectures internationally on the life and work of Marija Gambutas and is the author of more than 40 published articles including a biographical article about Mujik and Brutus in Harvard's Notable American Women, a biographical dictionary. With that, I welcome Joan Marler. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Please excuse my, my computer is deciding to make whirring sounds, but hopefully it will, sh it will close soon. Uh, so. The passing of our dear friend. Hold on, I'm going to click my. Uh, okay, the passing of our dear friend, colleague, and pioneering goddess scholar Carol P. Christ is a shock and a great loss for all of us. She entered the realm of the ancestors on July 14th, 2021, just two days before the beginning of the International Symposium in honor of Maria Gimpetus, where she was planning to speak. I am deeply grateful to her for allowing me to record her reading her text about Minoan religion in the village of Gornia on the island of Crete. Her generosity made it possible for us to hear her voice one last time on July 18th. Carol had an abiding appreciation for the scholarship of the Lithuanian American archeologist, archeomythologist Maria Gimbutas. Carol's writings and deep soundings reflect her profound respect for Gimbeta's work that weaves like a gleaming thread through her own writing and in her personal blogs while offering her own insights and some uh, uh, critiques. This brief presentation acknowledges the potency of Carol's writings and her own responses to Maria's concepts of the old European goddess and the civilization of old Europe. Both of these great scholars understood that our birthright from most of our human history has been to live in a respectful communion with the generative cycles of the living world. They understood that for thousands of years, humans have expressed concepts of the sacred source of life, expressed in female forms, carved, painted, and sculpted in numerous media, such as stone, bone, or ivory, created to nestle in the hand, to be worn as pendants close to their bodies, to be placed standing near hearth fires or carved on cave walls. The great Paleolithic goddess of Losal was carved on a bar, as a bas-relief on a large boulder stone in the Dordogne region of Southern France, dated to approximately 25,000 years ago. She has one hand on her pregnant belly while the other hand holds aloft a crescent shaped horn that is engraved with 13 marks, signifying the number of lunations within a solar year. Her sacred image originally elevated above the entrance to an intimate limestone cave would have been illuminated by the milky light of each full moon as a silent glowing presence honoring the generative mysteries of women's bodies and the cyclic realities of all life on earth in perfect harmony with the solar and lunar cycles of being. Both Carol and Maria have asserted that the typical emphasis on fertility as an explanation for the prevalence of female imagery during the Paleolithic period is incorrect. 
I would add that the typical usage of the term Venus as well as fertility are a function of the male gaze that assumes that women's main significance is to be in the service of male sex sexuality. But fertility is only one aspect of the life cycle that includes birth, maturation, death, and regeneration. During the 3000 year period of old Europe, 6500 to 3500 BCE, the earliest horticultural villages spread northward from what later became Greece into Macedonia, into the Balkans, into Central Europe and beyond to become what Maria Gimbutas called a true civilization in the best meaning of the word. At the center of these peaceful, vibrantly creative egalitarian societies was a deep respect and veneration for the living earth that made her millennial sustainability possible. There was a sustained outpouring of anthropomorphic, zoomorphic and hybrid sculptures, mostly female, molded in clay as well as in limestone, um, alabaster, marble and other materials. Many were rendered in highly stylized forms as well as elegantly sculptured into various postures and styles, often elaborately engraved with symbolic signs. In one of five major excavations of Neolithic sites, Maria directed in Southeastern Europe between 1967 and 1980, she discovered areas of women's productive work of grinding grain near large circular hearths and baking bread in outdoor ovens, each shaped as a pregnant belly. Communal transformation of grain into bread was continually accompanied by consistent ritual activities with uh, predominantly female imagery over 800 years at the Sesclo site of Achillion in Thessaly, Greece, between 6400 and 5600 BECE. Her excavations were the first to intentionally investigate the ritual contexts of these figures and related ceremonial images. 8,000 years later, after living, after years of living on the beautiful poetic island of Lesbos, Carol decided to move to Crete. In her February 2020 blog entitled Ancient Mothers, I Hear You Calling Me to Crete, Carol wrote, the fact that ancient Crete was, as Maria Gimbutas has written, the final flowering of the egalitarian, peaceful, matrilineal, probably matrilocal culture of old Europe that worshiped the goddess as the power of birth, death, and regeneration in all of life is the deeper reason I am moving to Crete a few weeks later, she was invited by archaeologist Vance Waltros to join the team that is interpreting the results of recent excavations of the Minoan town of Gornia, originally excavated by the American archaeologist Harry Boyd Hawes at the beginning of the 20th century. Carol writes, in agreeing to write about religion at Gornia for the new team, I was aware that I would be following in the footsteps of a very brave and very intelligent woman who understood as I do the culture of ancient Crete, that it was different from the familiar Greek patriarchy. She continues, Harriet Boyd Hawes, her colleague Blanche Wheeler Williams and Maria Gimbutas are ancestors calling me to Crete. They, along with a long line of women stretching back to those who first came to Crete, bringing with them the secrets of agriculture, are calling me to write without fear of any reprisal about the peaceful society of ancient Crete, where reverence for women and nature was at the center of everything. In contrast, the Christian God is understood to be transcendent of the world. In Carol's post blog of February 22nd, 2021, she explains that the British archeologist Colin Renfrew, citing the Oxford English Dictionary, quote, bases his decision of his discussion of Monoan religion on the idea of divine transcendence. But she writes, if we accept Maria Gimbutas insight that the goddess represents the powers of birth, death and regeneration in all forms of life, a different picture emerges. The goddess is eminent in rather than transcendent of the world. She is the enlivening force in human beings and in all nature. 
Carol goes on to explain, unlike other Greek deities, later Greek deities, the goddesses of old Europe and ancient Crete are not generally portrayed as idealized human beings, although they have eyes, breasts, sacred triangles, and also have beaks, they also have beaks and wings, are shaped like mountains and decorated with flowers, flowing lines, symbolizing rivers or streams. These hybrid forms suggest that all of life is in the imagery of divinity and that humans are not higher, better, or separate from other life forms. Hybrid images celebrate the connection of all beings in the web of life and call human beings to participate in and enjoy this world, not to seek to escape or rise above it. A religion centered around the gratitude for life in this world is very different from one that centers around fear and judgment and a longing for life after death. Maria Gimbutas relished the hybrid forms that combine a mature woman's body with the long neck of a water bird, uh, a bird mask and a human hairdo, snake-like features or female figure with the mask of a bear. Life-size masks such as one with the features of a sow was most likely made to be worn in ceremony, expressing an exchange of consciousness or mutual identity between woman and animal. Carol adds, when Gimbutas spoke of the powers of birth, death and regeneration in all of life, she was referring to the unity of being underlying the diversity of life forms, including plants, animals, and human beings. The fact that ancient Cretans imaged deity in different ways and with different characteristics does not require the conclusion that they worshiped many discrete deities as some archeologists argue. I suggest that they intuited a unity of being while celebrating the diversity of life. So Carol defined goddess as the intelligent embodied love that is in all beings. Maria's definition is related directly to the living earth. And in the, the language of the goddess, she writes, the goddess in all of her manifestations was a symbol of the unity of all life in nature. Her power was in water and stone, in tomb and cave, in animals and birds, snakes and fish, hills, trees and flowers. Hence the holistic and mythopoeic perception of the sacredness and mystery of all there is on earth. This includes, of course, death, destruction, and the grinding, chewing, and re releasing of nutrients of material that has died or is in the process of dying to release those nutrients for the nurturing of new life. And that distance between death and new life in which the decay takes place is so often rejected and not understood, particularly in the Christian tradition. Um, but here it is uh, forward and center in terms of the importance of nurturing life. Carol writes, it is known that rites in ancient Crete involved trees, mountains and caves, as well as water sources. We must ask, um, how such ceremonies expressed gratitude to the mother earth, the source of life, the cycles, birth, death, and regeneration. The mother's power to nurture life through love and generosity is understood to be a reflection of the power of the source of life. Carol has also recognized the egalitarian practices of the matriarchal Monongabau society in East Sumatra, where all members of the society are nurturers. Children's uncles, not their biological fathers, act as cultural fathers to children, expressing loving generosity and care. I will add that men as well as women um, must see themselves and act as nurturers through love and generosity. Um, and it's necessary for this to be cultivated by, by everyone, men and women, in order for life to continue on this earth, which is of course, our only home. As Carol reminds us, it is high time to rethink the hierarchy of values that we have inherited from patriarchal cultures, especially now when the continuation of life is threatened by war and global climate change. 
after she, she goes on, after having been promised immortality or reincarnation by patriarchal religions, many of us are returning to religions that celebrate the powers of birth, death, and regeneration, the, continu the continuation of life, not for the individual, but for the generations that follow. In the civilization of the goddess, Maria wrote, we must refocus our collective memory. The necessity of this has never been greater as we recover, discover that the path of progress is extinguishing the very conditions of life on earth. These messages from Carol and Maria are more essential now than they've ever been as we refine our inner powers and step forward as women of our time into an increasingly uncertain future. Carol and Maria both reside in the ancestral realm and their presence reminds us to feel the resonance of the living earth and to trust the deep ancestral wisdom that is within us and to recognize it in each other. After all, we are all ancestors in training. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan, for speaking on Calichrist's acknowledgement of Mujik and Bhutas and the imminence of the goddess in all of life. Thank you. So our next speaker is Inhi Li. And Inhi will speak on a journey toward the goddess, translating Rebirth of the Goddess by Carol P. Chris into Korean by the Academy Halmi of South Korea. Inhi is a lecturer, freelancer, translator, activist, and practices goddessing. She is the mother of two and grandmother of one. Born in South Korea in the middle of the Korean War, she later became an immigrant to the United States. Once a hippie traveler and tattoo artist, she went on to earn her PhD in philosophy and religion and women's spirituality at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. She has been active in her Korean American community in the San Francisco Bay Area and abroad including the goddess movement in South Korea. Currently, she is a member of the Academy Halmi of South Korea and a founding member of the Musok in Diaspora study group. Welcome, Inhi. Greetings from a secret chamber in Minoan Palace <laughs> in Konosos. I'm so honored uh, to share a story of a uh, Korean uh, group of Korean women's journey to the goddess by uh, mm, translating uh, books in women's spirituality. I'm greatly honored in presence of our founding mothers in flesh and in spirit. And uh, thanks to uh, Professor Mara Keller and uh, Annette Williams for the space uh, for us together. And uh, today I'm here to speak as a, a member of Academy of Halmi. Halmi means uh, grandmother. And also I didn't know until I was in women's spirituality, it also meant uh, goddess. So we are the Academy Halmi of South Korea. And I'm representing this group also, I'm speaking as a student of Professor Carol P. Christ. I was in her class in my first year doctoral study at uh, in women's spirituality. So first of all, uh, first I will speak of uh, background of uh, Academia Halmi. So by uh, mid 90s in South Korea, feminist movement was uh, seemed to be very uh, uh, pronounced by uh, uh, if magazine that is uh, like a miss magazine in the united states uh, first uh, volume was uh, it was quarterly first the issue was published in 1997 and lasted until 2006 now it's in online as we understand uh, feminist uh, spirituality is based based on rooted in feminism. So many of our members in Academy Halmi are from uh, this uh, 
uh, if a magazine uh, a publisher and the contributors. So it takes a little time to form a group. And I was in the United States since 1979. And I was longing to be connected with my Korean sisters in, you know, in the same passion uh, for crazy about the feminism, crazy about the feminist spirituality. And um, so forming Academy uh, Halmi, in this picture also there is a crit and uh, Professor Mara Keller and the Professor um, uh, Carol Christ. Uh, in 2009, one of uh, uh, our uh, current member, now Dr. Kim Myung-suk, she joined uh, uh, Professor Christie's uh, pilgrimage to Crete. And that year, Professor Mara Keller was on sabbatical. <laughs> so um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Keller put uh, me in cont contact with my sisters all scattered at that point in South Korea who really want to get together to be serious about God's studies. So 2010, we made a group. Uh, I call this If Goddess Group in Seoul. And we are in contact. Uh, we had a monthly gathering. And uh, then we kind of fizzled. And then we are in contact via social a network. And 2016, uh, we formed Academy Halmi. Our sole purpose is to gather the knowledge and uh, share the knowledge uh, of uh, women's spirituality and the goddess spirituality. So who are we? Uh, so we, are, uh, we started with 16 members and then now down to 13, which is perfect for a carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many of us are full-time full or part-time professors and the poet and the if books publisher, artist, somatic expressive, expressive art uh, healers, tarot card reader, meditation teacher. And the common ground of what we have is we are all uh, fluent uh, enough to translate. Um, and uh, we all have the same passion, almost a crazy passion. So far, we have uh, published, uh, uh, before we met uh, Kim Myung-ju, Professor Kim Myung-ju, she, uh, she had a, a reading group and uh, translated and published the women Spirit Rising in 2011, which I didn't know. And then uh, Academy Hwalmi, our first book we translated was uh, Great Cosmic Mother. And uh, we went into a problem publishing it. And then by the time we finished the reverse of the goddess by uh, Professor Christ, uh, Professor Kim Myung-ju of Chungnam University secured the uh, funding from the university press. So we published, and it's on sale now, published in 2020, and it's on sale. And I found out we printed about 300 copies. And uh, now um, about 210 copies are sold. And we are in the process of uh, Pro, um, translating, weaving the visions at the moment. And I will uh, talk about this uh, book. I want to go to second one. Yeah, second one. Yes. So this is the original on the left. And then uh, on the right is uh, uh, in Korean version. Oh, cool. Yes, yeah, so it's a little bit short, a little bit fat. And next one, next to slide. Yes. Yeah, so what we did was uh, we didn't use a noun. We didn't say reverse of the goddess. We say dashi means again. Teonanon is like a 
in the middle of being born, we use the present progressive tense as if it's happening right now. And then your shin is the goddess. So we want to give a more active, you know, present uh, uh, thing happening. So that's uh, how we, uh, we did. And then last screen. So in the uh, 2020, just before we published the book, uh, we contacted uh, Professor Christ and uh, she, mm, oh, I'm sorry, the last one, I'm sorry, last screen. The one before that, you mean? Yeah, uh, uh, the very last one. Oh, I guess they didn't put the... <laughs> yeah, what you have, this is what I have. Oh, I, I see. I, I revised that they didn't go through. Okay. So anyhow, then for our publishing, Professor Chris not only waived uh, any copyright piece, also she wrote uh, a extensive an article titled to the Korean reader in which she reflected her own thoughts after 25 mm -hmm. years later, writing her book. And we will share this article with you all later. And so this is the first book in search for the goddess in Korean by Dr. Kim Myung-suk who uh, uh, joined the pilgrimage, uh, Professor Christie's pilgrimage in Crete. So these two books, uh, in search for the goddess and the uh, reverse of goddess uh, two books out there for uh, our mm. women's spirituality movement. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, may uh, Spirit of uh, hey, I love that. Uh, <laughs> uh, lead us to post the patriarchy. Uh, share. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Annie. Thank, thank you. Wonderful, yay. And it's really inspiring to learn, you know, that the goddess studies, the virtues of goddess studies in South Korea and your part in that and the creation of Academy Helmi and the success of publication of these yeah. books, the translation of these works. I have a time getting, Yay. getting <laughs> Yay. So, well, so thank you very much for that. Our next speaker will be Nane Jordan. Nane will speak on Love at the Center, Living Goddess Studies with Carol P. Chris. Nane Jordan, PhD, is a goddess scholar, birth keeper, artist, community worker and mother of two daughters. She is devoted to women's spirituality, the divine feminine, mother earth, the maternal gift economy and goddessing worldwide. Active in mother-centered birth for over 30 years, she is a co-creatrix in the contemporary field of goddess studies where she develops theologies of birth. She has published widely, including editing the anthologies, A Sense of Wit, Mother Stories, Rituals and Research, 2017, and Pagan Goddess Mother, 2021. Jordan completed an MA in Women's Spirituality and a PhD in Education, and she, and she was a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada postdoctoral fellow in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Paris, France. Welcome, Nene. Thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Annette. Hi. Um, I just love hearing that story of uh, translations into Korean. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. It was a fun one to go on because you mentioned birth. And actually, I realized the paper, my paper really should have been titled Birthing Goddess Studies with Carol P. Christ. So I'm just going to dive in. Um, so I sit in an inflated tub of warm water in my living room, giving birth to my baby. The water guides me into deepening trance, holding and relaxing me with its fluid substance embrace. I am a baby held in the womb of some great goddess, even as I hold a baby in the amniotic waters of my own womb. Instinctively, my hands are working with each sensation. I raise my palms up out of the water, stretching them wide open like a salutation to the goddess. Yes, I feel your presence, mother, as I am mother now. 
These intuitive gestures came to me as I am in what is known as active labor. I would more describe this as a multidimensional dance of the universe, a meditation beyond meditations. With my hands stretched wide, I find myself hissing, hissing, as sensations build down low and then up along the sides of my womb. There is no mistaking this snake-like sound that guides my body to open in birth. I share this story segment from my own birthing experience, a moment of transmission to re-enter a creative embodied text. The juice of this writing born from feminist scholarly roots that nourish new forms of research, spiritual imaginaries and ways of being where experience from and in a female body is honored as source of knowing and text. Carol Christ writes of embodied thinking as an alternate to the mythos of purely objective thought. When we think through the body, we reflect upon standpoints embedded in our life experiences, histories, values, and interests. As embodied beings, quote, we admit that our scholarship is passionate, is interested, is aimed at transforming the world we have inherited. I wanted to honor Carol Chris passing through the mystery portal of death with this expression of gratitude for her co-creation and expansion of what we can now claim as scholarly fields of goddess studies and theology. Fields of study through which I can inquire into the flesh absorbed, imminent transcendent, spirit connected, shaktic, entranced experience of the holy, that is giving birth in both senses of that word, whole and holy. Being myself a daughter and co-creatrix of goddess studies, Chris Passing immediately compelled me to reread her, especially Odyssey with the Goddess, Rebirth of the Goddess and She Who Changes. Chris gestated goddess-centered feminine feminist inquiry from and with heart and spirit in a journey that reconnects mind to body and culture with nature, continually affirming that love is at the center. Her life-affirming embodied theological and practical priestessing work laid foundations for feminist liberation that resacralizes female-bodied selves through the studied and practiced honoring of women, goddesses, and Mother Earth. I reflect upon the impact of this in my own working towards a theology of birth, where I rewrite the primacy of birth from what Chris called the patriarchal lie in the denial of the womb that gives birth and the originary mother. Chris noted how the Western philosophical and theological focus on mortality and immortality rejects and ignores birth and the gift of life, suppressing female power at the confluence of philosophical and experiential rivers of inquiry in my own work, birthing experience pours out its female blood and milk soaked texts as libation to birth new philosophies and write the sacred book that has been left unwritten, picking up ancestral goddess threads woven long ago when we revered birthing powers in obvious connection to Mother Earth with her fierce, bountiful, life-giving and taking regenerative cycles of birth, life, death and birth again. This birthing confluence of inquiry is rooted in the goddess, Chris preferred term where she notes that theology begins an experience, meaning we can qualitatively explore and account for the quality and qualities of women's lives. With goddesses experience, I set out on my birth keeping theological path when I was a teenager in the late 1980s. After attending a home birth with midwives, I was awakened, awakened to a love of and trust in women's birthing powers rooted in women's self-authorizing desires, needs, and liberation, initiating my desire to honor the sacredness of birth from women empowering perspectives beyond patriarchal medicalization. Along with midwifery, I pursued my birth callings through women's spirituality and goddess studies where culture and spirituality can be reinformed by birthing consciousness 
as we shift from a traumatizing culture of patriarchy to a culture that gestates love and joy in expanding potentials of the divine feminine and female. Though Carol Chris did not give birth to or raise children of her own, she mothered a spiritual feminist social movement, living her own healing through birth-like processes. And I quote from her, in the process of my spiritual transformation, which I have sometimes called an initiation, I had to give up certain forms of ego control in order to open myself to the power of love that was all around me. Women giving birth live an ultimate initiation as they surrender ego control to open into their own naked, roaring inner outer strength to bring their new small human being, earth side, through the love portal as any goddess does. Chris's own calling into love was a felt initiation at her mother's death, where death is another birth-like portal. Chris, who acted as loving midwife for her mother's passing, beautifully writes, as my mom was dying, I had an absolutely clear sense that she was going to love. She was surrounded by a great matrix of love. And as she died, I began to understand that I too am surrounded by love and always have been. Birth and death are twin portals of entrance and exit with life. In birth, we enter through our mother's body, stretching through her sacred vulva yoni, this goddess portal incised into ancient rock art and stylized symbolically in the enduring symbol of the mandorla, or the sacred Sheila Nagig carved above doorways who displays her vulva as a portal reminder of whence we came and where we all go through the mother. In the words of Christ, I have long suggested that goddess religion teaches reverence for life that enables us to affirm finitude and death. And mothers and midwives know how natural birthing physiology can lead to mother's bodied ecstasy through the oxytocin love hormone infusion of giving birth. Birth may be painful or overwhelmingly sensation filled, yet can also unfold with pleasure and most always deep relief and joy. Oxytocin is the love and pleasure hormone at a lifetime peak when giving birth and present in all human acts of loving connection, something Carol Christ would have appreciated in her theological callings of love and its experience. Birth is not meant as women's suffering pain of biblical proportions, but to be lived with pleasure through supportive circles of caring connection and what Christ calls intelligent embodied love, where this life is meant to be enjoyed, I'm quoting Christ here, and to delight in the existence of others, to delight in our own life. I think of the beautiful goddess art and village temple sites of ancient Minoan Crete, beloved to Christ, where she studied, lived, and brought women to on pilgrimage. Enjoyment of life appeared at the core of this ancient goddess culture with its nourishing spiraling forms, butterflies and plant-based symbols, and bare-breasted, free-roaming women and priestesses in long skirts, residing over community affairs and life-affirming rituals, circulating oxytocin in a relational culture of well-being and embodied love. What if we knew love and joy as our birthright, literally at birth, where the bliss of new mothers and babies flows onwards from birth, honoring as Chris calls us to do the simple joys of our lives while lived in relation to our loved ones and all our relations with other living beings on mother earth. Our lives are truly rooted in birth as a primal gift of potent love experience. Whereas Chris notes and what we've been repeating today, I hear, the power of the goddess is the intelligent embodied love that is in all being. I close with more birthing story as we birth write our sacred embodied books anew. I lay on my side on our bed, pushing sensations are rolling through me at intervals. I needed to get onto my hands and knees. I'll never forget the feeling of holding the top curve of my daughter's head in my hand as I reach down to feel her emerging through my hugely stretched vulva. 
My husband gently held her head too as it came fully out, this touch connecting him deeply to his emerging daughter. In one more push, her whole body emerged, passed between my legs by my midwife and my mate. I scooped her up with the most intense feelings of relief and satisfaction I had ever known, holding, rocking, cooing to her. Oh, my love, my love, my little love. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Took you on a little journey there. <laughs> a little you birthing did. journey. <laughs> Just to make sure we get some birth energy in there today. Yeah, I was, I was, thank you for those evocative images <laughs> and, 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 and those thoughts, you know, on the honoring of human birth and the birthing of consciousness, you know, it made, made, made all be an oxytocin filled experience, you know, on every level. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, okay, our final speaker in the, on the panel today is Lisa Christie. So Dr. Lisa Christie, Lisa M. Christie, PhD, is adjunct faculty and writer, specializing in eco-feminist philosophy, process philosophy, goddess theology, and the study of psychic and spiritual experiences and the implications of these experiences for metaphysics. Lisa earned her doctoral degree in philosophy and religion with a concentration in women's spirituality from TIIS, her master's degree from Santa Clara University, and her coaching certification from the International Coach Academy. She has taught graduate and undergraduate courses since 2006 and is presently the adjunct senior lecturer at CIIS. Her upcoming book is Reality Unbound, a new science exploration of psychic experiences and the conscious world in which we live. Welcome, Dr. Christie. Mm, thank you, Annette. Um, theology begins in experience. This assertion by the theologian and feminist philosopher of religion, Carol P. Christ is revolutionary, especially given the strong influence that Christian theology with its emphasis on texts and their proper interpretation has had on our ideas of spiritual knowledge and authority. Religious beliefs arise from specific ways of knowing and within communities of knowing uh, from which women have been largely excluded. When Chris studied at Yale, she was one of very few women in that field. And she writes of how that community and its interpretive lens felt so alienating to her as a woman and at odds with many of her own experiences. She recognized that theology rests on a more fundamental assumptions about reality. And so she set about challenging those assumptions and proposing others that are more in keeping with her experience and those of other feminists in religion. In affirming women's experience as a primary source of knowledge, she leads us to a spiritual feminist paradigm. Importantly, in her feminist philosophy of religion, She Who Changes, Christ urges feminists to come together across religious traditions in order to share a way of thinking so that we can uh, make change, that we can help to evolve our culture. And she offered the process philosophy as a framework. Um, as Christ puts it, many fear that if women come together across religious traditional boundaries, all hell will break loose. And she adds, perhaps it should. I wholly agree. Here I will discuss Christ's embrace of process philosophy, which has inspired and informed me as a theologian and a feminist philosopher of religion. Christ, however, expresses ambivalence regarding life after death. And like the philosopher of religion, Charles Hartshorn, she rejects the concept of immortality for all but goddess God. For me, as a spiritual feminist who briefly saw the other side when my beloved husband was dying, and who regularly has experiences indicative of survival after death. I was disappointed that Chris asserted following Hartshorn that 
life after death is unintelligible in process philosophy. However, Christ did leave a breadcrumb in the form of a footnote that the professor of philosophy of religion, David Ray Griffin, holds a different view. I will summarize here Chris's valuable contributions to the feminist philosophy of religion that I wholeheartedly endorse as a potential platform for spiritual feminists in religion, uh, and then discuss some of her arguments against the concept of life after death, and then how process philosophy supports it. With regard to Chris's critique of traditional theology, her philosophy of religion responds to widespread theological and philosophical assumptions that maintain a male-centered worldview that subordinates women and not elite others. Like other feminists in religion, she critiques the prevalent stereotypes of God as an old white man on a throne uh, in the sky, uh, its patriarchy, hierarchical language, and inherent dualism that separates the world into spirit and matter, time and eternity. Regarding gender symbolism, Christ observes that the use of female rather than male pronouns for God tends to raise strong objections. The Christian philosopher Peter Kreeft and the Jesuit priest Ronald Tekeli express this view and their assertion that the metaphor of father safeguards the transcendence of God. The affirmation of the utter transcendence of God implies that creation, including our bodies and the earth bodies, is a lesser or fallen reality, leading to a dualistic worldview in which the mind or spirit is considered closer to God and the body part of the lesser reality of this world. Traditional theology also, and not coincidentally, commonly and casually assumes the inferiority of women and attributes this to men having a greater portion of mind and women having a greater portion of body, which is linked to the fallen world and uh, to the concept of sin. And of course, this is not logical. Men and women and other genders all have equal amounts of body and mind, but this sexual symbolism is so strong. The root metaphor of the omnipotent distant father also initiates a hierarchy of domination in which a God is being seen as at the top of the pinnacle, followed by male religious and or civil authorities by and large, and so on. Given God's distance or a proposed distance from the world, these authorities then become arbiters of reality. This is one of the reasons why Chris's assertion that Theology is based on experience is so revolutionary. Chris theology and process philosophy of religion paints a radically different picture of a holistic, deeply relational reality. Process philosophy was originally developed by the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead to both support and reconcile the insights of new studies in science, especially quantum mechanics and psychic and spiritual experiences, as he was affiliated with Centers for Parapsychological Research. Whereas most Western philosophers imagine the self to be solid and impenetrable, having only external relationships with other selves, for process philosophy, the self is fundamentally relational and penetrable, created in relationships and so is deeply affected and changed by them. These internal relationships comprise a web of changing individuals interacting with and affecting each other, co-creating the world. In process philosophy, God is God, as Chris calls it, is not distant from, but intimately related to the world. In the same way that we as animal bodied beings contain the cells, molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles that make up our bodies. In process thought, goddess God contains the world, and the world is infused with divinity, experience, and intelligence. Because we are all part of her 
own being. And I use the word her intentionally uh, because process philosophy is closer to female metaphors. Goddess God is sympathetic with us, feeling our joys and sorrows and seeks the highest good for all beings. In this way, Goddess God is more like the metaphoric mother than the metaphoric father. Further, unlike the omnipotent God of traditional theology, the Goddess God of process thought shares power with the creatures of this world who have free will. This model of power expressed as power with rather than domination. Rather than being omnipotent, goddess God nudges us towards the highest good as seen from her perspective. In my view, the structure of process philosophy leans towards partnership and respect for humans and the rest of the intelligent and creative natural world. With regard to death, Chris describes her own experiences suggested of life and death and acknowledges that many spiritual feminists have these experiences. However, she is ambivalent about the possibility of life after death, especially the idea of immortality, both of which she questions from a feminist and philosophical perspective. To reconcile these conflicting perspectives, she develops the concept of a limited survival after death for as long as we are remembered by the living. Chris asks, is a belief in life after death compatible with spiritual feminism as an embodied spirituality that revalorizes the personal body and nature? She observes that feminists and religion have largely ignored or been negative on this topic. Further drawing from the process philosophy of Hartshorn, she asks, given the feminist view that we are coexistent with our bodies, that we are our bodies. Can the belief that some part of us can survive death of the body intelligible from process philosophy perspective? And we'll respond to each of those questions. First, regarding feminism, in revalorizing the body and nature, we need not discard the proverbial baby with the bathwater. My own study of a broad range of women's spiritual experiences and the psycho parapsychological literature suggests that these experiences cannot be so easily dismissed as wishful or patriarchal thinking. Further, life after death need not lead to a devaluation of the natural matrix. In her essay towards an ecofeminist ethic of shamanism and the sacred, the ecofeminist scholar Gloria Feeman Orenstein describes learning from her Sami teacher that for the Sami, embodied modes of knowing are valued as highly as less embodied modes of knowing, such as shamanic flight. So, given that life after death need not be incompatible with the commitments of spiritual feminism. Is a belief in life after death consistent with process philosophy? Hartshorn puts this bluntly, what we could be without our bodies, he says, is gibberish. However, <clears throat> this is misleading. Whitehead asserted that process philosophy is neutral on the question and that it should be decided by the evidence. Hartshorn himself later conceded in personal correspondence with Griffin that his view of the mind-body relationship does make survival possible. And Griffin describes how process philosophy can support it in several of his works. The key difference between process philosophy's support for life after death and the conventional theological view is that process philosophy is holistic rather than dualistic. Instead of opposing body and mind, it considers both mentality and physicality to be aspects of each entity. Key here is the distinction between what we call body and the mind is that the physical body is a community of many entities, including cells, molecules, and atoms, and therefore there's not a strict identity between mind and body. 
Rather, process philosophers have variously conceptualized our relationship to our bodies from being a tiny entity that wanders around the body, depending on our focus of attention, to our being roughly continuous with our body, to our being continuous with the cosmos as a whole, as in some mystical experiences of unity. Further, process philosophy suggests that even after death, we always have a stake in a world that cannot be conceived as being separate from ourselves. In summary, Christ introduces to spiritual feminists a fully fleshed out worldview that reflects our values. And though her experience and ideological commitments lead her to a more limited understanding of life after death, I propose that it can support a much broader view. And in affirming this capacity, I hope to have extended the appeal of her work to those of us for whom such commitments and belief in life after death are important. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, that was a really one of the clearest, most accessible explanations I've ever heard of process philosophy. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And um, speaking to Carol's views um, and you know her belief in a limited um, life after death, there's an African view that, you know, which is similar, it says that the ancestors live as long as they are remembered. Yes. So if there's ever just similar to, to, to what Carol, to Carol's view. Yes, and I wouldn't be surprised if that influenced her thought process as well. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we have, exactly, we have about one minute. So that's really just enough time um, to wrap up and to say thank you. To, to the panel members, thank you so much to Joan Marler, to Inhi Lee, to Nana Jordan, and to Lisa Christie for your contribution to this panel, Goddess Studies, Theology, and Egalitarian Matriarchal Studies. Um, I have a one, uh, one, one thing I would like to add uh, to uh, Joan uh, Marler, that uh, goddess, the language of the goddess is public, uh, translated and published in Korean too. I want you to know that. <laughs> Joan, you're muted. I didn't mark, I don't know if you wanted to say anything in response. That's really excellent uh, news. Thank you so much, and Lee. I really appreciate that. And for all of your dedicated work to, I mean, crossing cultures, crossing, I mean, this is not like from one European uh, country to the next or language to the next. So you have really made a, a very important bridge and I, I, I'm grateful to you for that and for much more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we should, you should all be seeing a little sign now about leaving the breakout group and getting going back to the main room. And at two o'clock, we're gonna have our ritual, or right away, I should say not at two, we're going to have our ritual of remembrance that will be led by Starhawk. So something to really look forward to, the honoring of, of Carol Christ by those who knew her well. <laughs>